This session is entitled Basic Understanding of the Pathophysiology and Management of Patients with Postpartum Fever. Postpartum febrile morbidity has been defined by the U.S. Joint Commission on Maternal Welfare as any two temperatures greater than 100.4 degrees Fahrenheit or 38 degrees Celsius within the first 10 days postpartum, excluding the first 24 hours since low-grade temps that resolve spontaneously after vaginal delivery are common. When you're called to evaluate a patient with an elevated temperature, you need to consider several things. First of all, where was the temperature taken? Is it an oral temperature, a rectal temperature, or an axillary temperature? The numbers we just discussed were actually oral temperatures. Remember that rectal temperatures can be about one degree higher and axillary temperatures about one degree lower than oral temperatures. It's also important to ask the patient if she's had anything hot or cold to drink recently or has she smoked recently. In addition, you want to be sure that she's not taking any antipyretics. As with any disease entity, the patient's history and medical records should be reviewed to give clues as to the source of the febrile morbidity. Then a careful examination is warranted, looking for focal findings that might suggest a source of infection. Fevers in post-op patients from cesareans should be evaluated for the six W's. The six W's include, first of all, wind. Is there atelectasis from a recent intubation? How about water? Does she have a urinary tract infection or polynephritis from bladder catheterization? How about the wound? Is it infected? Does it look angry? Has she been walking? Does she have a DVT as a source for her fever? What about wonder drugs? Has she had a medication that could cause the fever, such as cephalosporin? And lastly, all of our patients are women and have a womb that may be the source of her infection and have breast, which might have mastitis. Most common source of postpartum infection is actually the womb. And for that reason, the remainder of this talk will focus on purpural endometritis. Let's begin by discussing the frequency of purpural endometritis. Following a vaginal delivery, the risk for metritis is 1 to 3 percent. If the patient has an elective c-section, that risk increases to about 7 percent. However, in patients who labor and then have a cesarean section, the risk can be as high as 30 percent. Now these two risks can be halved if the patient has prophylactic antibiotics. The pathophysiology of purpural endometritis is fairly straightforward. Most likely is an ascending infection from the lower genital tract and therefore things that colonize the lower genital tract are the source for infection. Things like group B strep, other streps, anaerobic gram-negative bacilli like E. coli or Proteus or Klebsiella. And then there's the group of anaerobic gram-negative bacilli like Bacteroides. Chlamydia is not a common cause of early onset purpural metritis, but has been implicated in late onset infection two to three weeks after delivery. Now, risk factors are multiple. The most common ones are things that lead to prolonged labor, prolonged rupture of the membranes, multiple cervical exams, especially after rupture of the membranes. Internal monitors, whether for fetal heart rate monitoring or intrauterine pressure catheters, 
if there's meconium staining in the amniotic fluid, the manual removal of the placenta, low socioeconomic class, various maternal diseases such as diabetes or severe anemia, preterm deliveries, postterm deliveries, operative deliveries vaginally like forceps or vacuum, and patients with HIV infection or colonization with root B strep. Now the most common clinical picture, we began our discussion by saying almost all of these patients have an elevated temperature. They may have tachycardia on exam. Some of them will experience malaise. They may have uterine or abdominal pain or tenderness, and some patients will also complain of a lochia that is malodorous or discolored. The differential diagnosis is the things we discussed previously, atelectasis, pneumonia, viral syndromes, polynephritis, and appendicitis. The diagnosis of endometritis is a clinical diagnosis supported by the patient's history, physical exam, and laboratory findings. Now, what laboratory findings should you start to order? Almost all patients deserve a CBC and a urinalysis with a culture insensitivity. For selected patients at risk for sepsis, you may also obtain a blood culture those that have immunocompromised states or those at risk for bacterial endocarditis. And occasionally a patient will warrant a chest x-ray, something on her physical exam, suggest pulmonary source of her infection. And if the wound is open during the examination, the patient would warrant a wound culture. And once you've made the diagnosis of purpural endomyometritis, the question is management. Management centers around IV antibiotics. The combination of clindamycin and genomycin is effective with cure rates of over 90% in the literature. Other reasonable options include other antibiotics that cover the organisms we discussed previously, such as second or third generation cephalosporins. Once antibiotics are begun, 90% of patients will defervesce within 48 to 72 hours. Once the patient has been afebrile for 24 hours, parenteral antibiotics should be discontinued and the patient discharged. One possible exception to this would be the patient with positive blood cultures who may require an additional week of oral antibiotics. Now what about the occasional patient that has persistent fever for greater than three to four days after you've initiated antibiotic therapy. Those patients fall into one of two groups, those with the usual causes and those with an unusual cause. Under the usual causes are things like resistant organisms. Clindamycin and genomycin do leave a gap in coverage of enterococci. For that reason, the addition of ampicillin or penicillin may actually take care of the persistent fever. There is also some anaerobic gram-negative bacilli coverage that is lacked and changing clindamycin to metronidazole may resolve the persistent fever. The other usual cause is the wound. Any patient with persistent fever needs to be re-examined and if the wound has any signs of infection it needs to be incised and drained. If there's extensive cellulitis at the margin of the incision you should consider using an antibiotic that targets staphylococcus such as nafcillin. Now the unusual causes include things like abscess. This is diagnosed either through CT scan, MRI, and occasionally ultrasound. And if found, drainage needs to occur. This can frequently be done radiographically without the need for surgery. 
An entity called septic vein thrombosis may also be identified via CT scan or MRI. And if that is diagnosed, either a course of continued IV antibiotics or a trial of heparin therapy may be entertained. Drug fevers are still possible. And if there is an eosinophilia on white count, you might consider discontinuation of antibiotics with observation. And lastly, there's the occasional patient that has a newly diagnosed connective tissue disorder. Those patients will need appropriate serology and an ANA and perhaps a short course of corticosteroids. As with any disease, the best treatment is prevention. The prevention centers around things that we have already discussed. Be aggressive in the treatment of lower genital tract infections in the antepartum and intrapartum period, things like bacterial vaginosis or group B strep. Minimize cervical exams once rupture of membranes has occurred. Use prophylactic antibiotics at the time of cesarean and deliver the placenta, if possible, spontaneously without manual extraction at both cesarean section and SVD. This includes the session on pathophysiology and management of patients with postpartum fever.